Welcome all to another real-time video of me painting. I'm taking images from photographs I took at Oval Beach in Saugatuck, Michigan. My camera data says it's somewhere around April 2019, end of April, but I think it was actually earlier than that because it was freaking cold when I was there. So. Here's the image that we're painting from today. I'm going to use a little bitty chunky 6x6 canvas that I've already primed with, uh, it's probably something like Conacridon, Magenta, and big words like that. Forgive me, I just woke up. Now, this little, I love these little bright pinks, especially because that image had so many blues and kind of dull greens. So I'll put something really bright behind it. And I'm using a big thick charcoal to lay all this stuff in. because I love using charcoal for this because you can smudge it and erase it with water. It's super easy to get rid of. I don't think the carbon really affects the acrylic underneath at all. Acrylic is a plastic and kind of locks things in. And I believe that artists have been using this for so many centuries actually to block in paintings like that. And you can smudge it around and draw and it's also something kind of chunky. So it, yes, you're making lines, but it's easy to make larger shapes if you need to as well. And so you'll see me go back and forth because I don't think I actually left the water line right there. I think I moved it. And you can also see me adding different lines to where that is. Now, sometimes you'll see me add lines for the grass here and there. And I'm not really trying to start drawing in grass, honestly. What I'm trying to do is show the direction of the grass or maybe a few things that really stand out on the grass to remind myself later. And that helps compositionally because if you squinted at this drawing, which unfortunately is off screen at this point, it's kind of one big blob. If you squint really good, it's a very neutral I'm sorry, wrong word, mid-tone painting with that grass, which is kind of the beauty of it because it's, it's relaxing, but you'd need to compensate for the composition not being that strong, like with values. So I think I'm also just making some stuff up at that point because it's been a long time since I've painted this, but that's what I had in mind. And you see me smudge out the things I didn't think worked so well. Um, it looks like I'm corrected a few of those things with the path going to the back like that, especially with the waterline being lower than the, the point where the path goes up. You'll see me per correct the perspective of that a little bit. And now you'll see me mix with my palette knife or painting knife. Painting knives are the ones who actually have the crook in the handle like that, which I prefer. I like these little skinny ones. And you're seeing me mix the paint with that because otherwise you overload the brush. And I also like to paint with my darn palette knife. Um, and you're seeing why right here. It's, it just, it's like frosting. It's like painting with frosting, almost, not literally, although some people have but it adds a different effect to things. You can blend different, and especially with those bristle brushes you're seeing to the right, you can overload those with paint too fast when you mix with that because you'll get weird paint up into the bristles and it, it doesn't come out the same. It doesn't blend the same and you get an interesting texture when it comes out. Uh, you'll also notice that I've got a gray palette right there. It's a gray glass palette that my then boyfriend got for me. Well, he's not an ex now. I married him because he got me art supplies. It's a good man right there. That's not why I married him. It's a good reason though. Anyhow, the pal glass palettes, they're awesome. I haven't done this in another video yet. You'll see me use different supplies because that's the way I roll, but I love this little glass palette and I want a big one. The idea behind a glass gray palette is that you can check your paint against a very neutral 50% gray, which is good for learning and continuing to control your values. I think on a white palette that you can often mix things too dark. And that is definitely the problem I was having. Now I honestly think I was using a bit of Prussian blue here and not ultramarine blue. 
although I tend to mostly paint with ultramarine blue, very warm blues for these, and I'll usually add a bit of phthalo blue to the sky, but for this one and a lot of these, it'll be very warm. I'm trying to figure out what red I'm using right there. Oh, it's probably a cadmium medium is my guess. Making some orange, and I realize my palette that I'm actually having the paint on is off screen right here. So I'll try to call it the colors as they come onto my mixing palette, but I definitely showed you that on the camera on purpose. Ah, uh, yes. That actually looks like a Naples yellow hue and some burnt sienna. It could be a cadmium medium. This is a fun guessing game with colors right here. Cadmium yellow medium hue at this point, most likely, and then the burnt sienna make a nice... It's just a nice, pleasant orangish yellow right there. You kind of see that on that gray palette, but because I'm now mixing with my brush, you're seeing it getting muddy real dang fast with everything on my brush. You can see the blue still on my brush, but that dull blue and those dull yellows and oranges just really bring out the, the darn sand, honestly, on Lake Michigan right there. So that is Lake Michigan near Saugatuck. Also Michigan, everything's Michigan right there. And I'm trying to leave a little bit of that pink underneath it, although you'll probably see me going over all of this again and again. And I'm trying to keep in mind to leave edges, honestly, because I love seeing those little backgrounds of the canvas come through. Now, I know I left some blue on the bottom of that brush right here on purpose, because you need something contrasting for that grass to stand up on. And once that started to go away my brush, I started to work on a different section, you'll notice. So on the left, you know, where my brush isn't, you'll see that dark base of the grass that I used, what was on the brush, to give it a bit more of a shadow and dimensionality to that grass. I don't care about dimensionality of grass or sand on the sides of the little canvas doohickey right here. I'm stuck. I think this was the time I started to actually paint all around the edge of the canvas instead of painting the edges black. And there were two reasons for this. I'd painted them all black before to kind of make them all match as a set, so I've had plenty of collectors put them all together and have a show that I'm not going to frame them, so I'll paint them all black. It just doesn't look right to me anymore. But I have noticed, especially in these smaller canvases, you're adding a lot of square inch painting when you go around the edge because that's an inch and a half thick. These are thick little guys meant to stand up by themselves. So the bottom's going to wear out a little bit. That's just life. It's plastic, whatever. But if you have all those sides, that's almost the same, almost the same amount of square inch that you're painting on the front. And if you charge by the square inch and you do everything with those details, it's something to keep in mind. But it's a lot more painting, although I tend to just kind of mush some more colors on there that make it match. And it can make the painting look bigger or bring it into your space. Ah, purple. Dioxanine purple. I don't have the tube in front of me right now. That's, um, that's what it looks like in my head. And... I'm loving playing with this purple in the shadows, using a warm color purple in the shadows, but it's also because it's the opposite of yellow on ye old six color color wheel. That makes it a complement of yellow, which the complements help each other look brighter. So even though I've got a really dull yellow and then this purple next to it, it helps the yellows and the sands pop out and make a wonderful little shadow that even though they're opposites, they also go together really well because of that. It's, it's a weird thing with the color wheel that opposites can enhance each other if you use them right. And I'm going to go ahead and say that I used them just fine with this one because I loved how it turned out. So here I am mixing with, it's probably maple's yellow or yellow ochre, something nice and dull at this point. I love both of those, especially for grasses and sand, because they are so dull and dark. Which, if you start with a cadmium, you mix so much other stuff into it. I think I'm just making up words now of why I have all that. And I could have mixed it with that burnt sienna, which is also a wonderful color to use. 
with those dull blooms, but I also definitely intentionally laid down something darker than that pink so I could go on top of it again with the yellow. And that gives a dimensionality and you can see the kind of the flowing hills of the dunes right there on the beach. It was freaking cold the day we went out there. Uh, I was out on that day taking pictures with a plain air painting group that go all throughout Southwest Michigan and it fits at different parks and conservatory parks and things like that. And these crazy artists will go out in the winter a lot. I learned that 40 degrees is about as low as I can handle for paint. And it's not even, I mean, it's just me. It's not even the paint. Although I have painted where it's cold enough that my water has frozen up a little bit. And so is the acrylic paint. And what happened is that I got wonderful texture while I was out there and it was literally snowing on my paint, which isn't really a problem when it's acrylic until it melted. And it literally melted all of the texture and my paint just relaxed as soon as my car warmed up. I probably have a picture of that somewhere. Anyway, back to this one. There's a reason I didn't finish this one in the field. Although I did paint something. I kind of nestled myself down in the dunes and hid. More colors! You'll see me mix that wonderful little pale green. I wouldn't even call that a mint green because I've been making mint green now. But I'm just getting so many different hues. Different that for, for color learning purposes, hue is just the name of the color. Not value, not intensity. It's like, is it red or is it green? Is it more blue or yellow? Not about how dull it is, not about how dark it is, but when you're simply talking about the hue and adding a bunch of hues that are the same value is one trick to make something glitter a little bit. In fact, that was one of the secrets I believe that Monet or Mane used. Yes, there's a big difference. I don't remember exactly which one they were talking about at the time because, I mean, come on, it's easy to be dyslexic when their names are so similar. But in the clouds, when you've got one big section that is a very similar color or the exact same color, changing up either the the, the temperature of the color, so making warms and cools of that same value, so you squint and it all looks the same, but you change up the warm and cold, or even a little bit of the hue but keeping it the same value, can help make it glitter a little bit and add interest to a place that could have otherwise just been one flat color. And you'll see me go over the sky a little bit again with that. The titanium white I use tends to make whatever color I mix it with a little colder, I think. And that contrasts nicely in the sky. Of course, you notice how I love to talk about things that are the opposite of things happening in the painting right now. Go figure. Ooh, what's next? Did I just wash out a brush? I don't do that very often because too much water on the brush can mess with the paint and I'd like a lot of texture on my paint. But once you mix with your brush enough, you've loaded it. And once that sucker dries, it's dead. So washing it out is important still. Yes, putting that nice bright yellow on top of that to really bring it out. I love that muddy mess on that canvas right now because I also know where it's going. It's a nice, just a nice little <laughs> patch of yellow mud. I like the colors right now. I also know where a lot of it's going and a lot of it is still under painting for the stuff I'm putting on top. And another reason I'm doing this y lighter yellow now is I'm giving the bottom a chance to dry. And that's v also very important when you are working with those opposite colors. The purple would overpower that yellow so easily if I was working it with still wet and wet. Now, I'm painting this entire little painting in about 35 minutes. So that's how fast acrylic dries. This is real time. I, once I know where I'm going, I go there fast. This is a real time video. I twitch around with my little brush that fast when I know where I'm going. And that's also the secret of knowing where you're going 
it doesn't take as long. And I also don't blend as much either, you've noticed. I just kind of slap that little paint on there and call it good. All right. So I'm putting more browns down. I've kind of covered a lot of the blue, orange purples that I've put on there before. And here I'm actually going back into that wet orange. That wet burnt sienna is a very orange color. And I'll just go back and forth and add some more stuff in. Add some shadows to those dunes. But acrylic paint will dry that fast. There are things you can add to it so that it doesn't. I don't think there's anything you can add to it that will make it dry faster. I wonder if it really is the fastest drying paint. I do not know. I do know that different kinds of pigments, like different blues and burnt siennas, their the different chemical properties actually make them dry at different rates as well. Not enough that you really have to worry about it with layering with acrylic, but definitely enough that you'd notice if you're doing a very quick plain air painting, especially in oils, because it really is about the pigment. It's not about the binder. Uh, the difference of how long. I think Burnt Santa dries a lot faster than Ultramarine, although I could be dyslexic again and be doing the whole thing backwards. But I've noticed on my palette with acrylic, even if I spray my palette, some of these will be goopy underneath for longer or set up and be hard faster, even though overall, of course, it dries quicker. That's the point of acrylic to a point. Um, or with oil painting, I'll have one of my plain air wonderful teacher friends. I love that group. I miss them. They they know so much about the oils, mostly mostly painting in oils out in the field, more traditional. Also gives them more working time with a lot of these paints. But that also means they can't layer and they've got to know pace themselves. They've got to know how to pace themselves. And there's pros and cons to that too. But I'm just, that's just coming to mind right now when I'm painting this because of how many people out there on that day we took the pictures who were doing painting in oil and it was freaking cold. So I'm just reminded of all that right now. I have put a little bit of Naples yellow down there. Naples yellow's hue. So that means it's a fake version of Naples yellow. I'm not sure why Naples yellow, the, the real stuff, is so much more expensive or why they need to make a hue version of it. Usually when it's a hue version, you know, the fake kind, it's because it's either more toxic or it's a very expensive pigment, like cobalt hue and regular cobalt. I should write down some time to do a um, comparison of different cobalt colors, because I certainly have probably plenty enough of them. That is one of those blues, literally made from cobalt blue. Um, sometimes a lot of those are like a rust version of a metal, like titanium white. It is the rust of titanium. Burnt sienna is from, and ochres are from a lot of natural ochre pigments, which is just a version of a rusty mud, honestly. Different forms of rust and chemicals in the earth. So when you fake a cobalt like that, you have to be, it, it's hard to get a good fake cobalt, honestly. That's probably one of the trickiest hues that I have seen to get a really deep, rich color. I have been lucky enough to be gifted real cobalt hue. I want, I'm not sure if that's one of the more toxic ones. Honestly, don't lick it. You shouldn't be licking your painting anyway, please. I'm careful on if I get paint on my skin to not eat and to make sure to wash my hands soon afterwards. I can be a finger painter. So even if I use cadmium yellow to finger paint, I wipe it off in five minutes. Cadmiums especially. Um, the, the real ones, they can be a carcinogen. I said that word. They can be toxic, just like lead. Lead, you could have lead bits in your phone because it's a useful little chemical, you know. Don't eat it, don't lick it, don't have it on your skin for long, and you're fine. All those chemicals that I would paint with here are embedded in plastic, so I feel confident that they're not going to get anywhere and... If people are licking my paintings, they've got bigger issues. I 
think. Please don't lick paint, guys. Please. Now, I have had one dog lick a painting. So, that painting was Darla approved. But I do often put a coat of other gloss on top of my paintings. So, there's a barrier. She's fine. I am not worried about her at all for licking that painting. So, one slurp probably ain't going to hurt you. Please don't lick painting. I went on a bunny trail right there. All right, back into this wonderful world of grass where I've got Naples yellow. I love how dull and pigmented that color is, and I'll often use it as a background for other painting. I've got some titanium white that I'm pushing back into that Naples yellow, and you also saw me mix more of that dioxine, I'm just going to call it that for now, purple. I'll try to leave a list of the different pigments that I have used below. I'm either using all heavy body Liquitex or golden colors for this. And I mention that because those are some of my most favorite brands of acrylic paints. If you are a beginner artist, I recommend getting Liquitex Basics and not going any lower in brand. Not store brand, please, please know I've tried with those. If you're learning to mix traditional pigments like um, Naples Yellow or Titanium White or Ultramarine Blue, if you go any cheaper with that, they get weird. And there's so much filler that you're not really learning to mix with the pigment anymore. And there's a point down the road that it doesn't matter anymore if you know what you're doing with the paint. Like, I'm learning to use the opacity of those little two ounce bottles of chalky craft paint. They can be fun! They can cover wonderfully if that's what you want. I'm also a little hesitant to the binding quality of those if you put better paint on top of it and there's better binding with the acrylic. And of course the science of acrylic paints might be another story for another day. But please, Liquitex on Basics on Up, this is not a sponsored video. I mean, if Liqu Liquitex wants to spot or sponsor me, we can talk. But I just recommend that stuff out of my own darn self. But the Heavy Body and then Golden is often celebrated as one of the premier acrylic paints as well. And I really like that thickness because of the texture you get. I don't like colored canvases where you still have an even canvas texture everywhere. Some people love it. Cool. Good for you. To me, there's almost no difference between that and a print, especially if you have a canvas print. There's no difference. Honestly, why would you spend any more for original with the texture? I want a painting. I don't want a colored canvas. <laughs> I want to see the brush strokes, and that's half the fun. That's half of the beautiful texture of the paint get in there, but that's also because you'll notice I don't blend that much. I love those brush strokes. I stick that thing on there and I let it be, and then I change my mind five minutes later and stick something else on top. That's the way I painted this little guy anyway. I'm going around the edges a little bit. There's my hairy arm going around the edge of that painting while not budging it. That skill right there. These little guys travel across. I've used a small patch to mix most of this stuff, but most of the paint I'm pulling from is on my plastic palette off to the right. And I'll be working on trying to get a palette cam because it seems like people love to see that color mixing. Excuse me. I'm adding more of that purples and oranges on top of the green, so it's really starting to. I, I use the word glitter because you get almost a, it's not a sparkle. I'm going to try to think of a better word for for what I'm using right here, but undulating does not seem like the best word that I'm talking about right here, but even if you squint, you get a big shape, and you can still see some oranges and blues glittering. I'm just going to use that word now. It moves back and forth, even though, I mean, I don't want it to look like one plane. I want it to look like a dune, darn it. But I'm still adding those different hues and teeny difference in value for a bigger shape like, like that. And I say that now because I believe that this made a successful painting at the end. So I'm going back and forth. There are so many purples that I have covered up. Especially with acrylic paints, I feel like you have more 
room to wiggle for covering something up again. Now there are definitely techniques where you've got one shot. Some glazing, you'd have to start over from the bottom layer and if you didn't like how that glaze worked, or some texture techniques with gel and transparencies. But if you're working with a lot of opaque paint, it is so easy to just stick something else on top and cover up if you don't like what you did. That's one of the beauties of acrylic paint, especially when you do plain air or something like that, if you're working with the transparent versions. All right. I believe I'm messing around with the sky. Yes, I'm dulling it down with a tiny little bit of that orange. Orange and blue are opposites in the color wheel. So I'm working with a lot of opposites here. The yellow and purple in the grass, and then a little bit of orange and blue to dull down the sky. Michigan has very, very dull skies when it's that overcast. And I do know you will see me going back over that entire sky because it was just too dark. What I'm doing here is too dark. It's too blue and too bright. Even with that, it's just too darn dark and bright, of bright of a blue. Um, brightness in color and paint doesn't necessarily have to do with how light or dark it is. It has to do with how pure of a pigment you've got. Kind of per pure of a hue, we'll say. So that there's nothing of the complement mixed in with it. When you mix those complements together, you get, well, a lot of people say muddy, but that implies that you're not supposed to use it. You can mix those together on purpose to get a duller color on purpose. In fact, in Michigan Springs, it's really darn dull out there. You want that if you want something more realistic. So a phthalo blue, a really bright, juicy blue, is what we would call a bright, pure color and then you add the opposite to that and it gets duller from there. A lot of people will use phthalo blue as their primary only blue that they buy. You can totally do this. It makes a nice limited palette. You only have to buy like five tubes of paint in your life, but that's not fun. I also love different kinds of hues. It's one of the, I would say almost non-traditional because it's a newer chemical blue. Ultramarine blue has another richer history to it. It's more of a traditional pigment, goes back into history. There's more information on using it here and there. I just like warm blues as well. So there's a little bit of pigment stuff for you and compliments. So the subject of this video will be about painting with complement colors and dulling them down and making them glitter a little bit. Until somebody else really has a better word than making it glitter, please let me know what, what word am I not thinking of right now when it comes to using different hues and color temperatures in one plane or one big section of your painting. It's a very simple composition. I'm still loving how this is working right now. If you squint, you definitely have some big triangles going off to the little focal point where, you know, you run up that hill as fast as you can and jump off. Do you land in the lake? Or don't you? We were actually much farther away from the lake than that at that point. Although I don't really care if it looks like we were closer. I don't think it does. But that'd be kind of fun. I like the mystery of a path landing. Hello, Gandalf. My studio assistant is making his presence known next to me. Gandalf, there's someone like to say. Nope, he found his breakfast. All right, what am I going to do next? Because I know I'm not quite done. Oh, yep, sky. Now you're seeing me be very disgruntled with that bright sky that I have on top. I'm wanting it brighter and brighter and lighter and lighter. Lots of white. Now, you might see me break a rule right here. Normally, you mix light, hold on a second, darks into lights because that dark is very, what's the best word, toxic, infectious. Dark colors will permeate a light one a lot quicker than the other way around, than if you mixed a white into a dark. So you could be mixing like half a tablespoon of white back into a color to get the right one, rather than one little dab of blue going into your pile of white. So 
as a general rule, always stick the darker color into the lighter one. And it's more controllable, you use less paint. And then of course I break the rules all the time and then like, no, I want this color. And then I end up with a big pile of this stuff. Like that. Yeah. But that's also a consequence of mixing with your brush on the palette. There are different ways people will mix paint. Some people mix paint and they'll only use those five colors they mixed up. It's a different way of using a limited palette and can control in your values. I should actually do that as a challenge sometime. I should mix, pre-mix all of my colors and the amounts I think I need them. And I'm not allowed to mix those together. So you might even end up with 15 little piles of paint that you have mixed up. And to the people using this technique, it also saves you time later on of guessing what color you need to mix up. There's a lot of pre-planning involved. And you've got a controlled set of values that you've also planned for when you do this. But you'll notice with my little brush making, I tend to do a lot of mixing as I go to fit that one little section. And that's something that a lot of wine and canvas things don't actually do, is a lot of mixing to fit one little section you need. It's a lot of pre-mixing your colors beforehand, I believe, or you take a scoop of this pile and a scoop of that pile, and the teacher magically knows in advance that these two colors go together and will mix fine on the canvas. That is stuff I like to try to teach, but I believe there's a lot of background hue knowledge if you just mix what you need to go at a time. The consequence, of course, is that you make a really muddy palette and I have to scrape it off again. So there's pros and cons to all of these different techniques. I should totally try a pre-mixing challenge sometime. Well, it's a challenge to me because I go back and forth. If anything, it's probably more inefficient to do it like this because I'm guessing and like, eh, no, doesn't look right. Try it again. And I'm okay with that. Again, this little guy only took about a half an hour to learn all this little stuff right here, but we're definitely going with a lot of opposites. You've got the opposites on top of the blue and that burnt sienna. It's a brown orange. Those two colors are great for Michigan landscape skies to make them just a dull grayer color. And then you've got the opposites that I leave separated at the bottom to make them dance with each other. The purples and the yellows at the bottom. And you'll see some more oranges and, you know, stuff. You'll also see that pink is almost completely gone underneath. That's okay. I still like to believe that it lends a warmth to the colors on top anyway. Some people say that paint is never fully opaque particularly with oil paints, and that you always will have an influence of what's underneath with oil paints to what's on top. Eh, okay, cool. Maybe. I guess. They can do really cool x-rays with oil paint stuff, actually. Look it up. X-ray oil paintings. They can... well, it's x-rays and some other kind of tests that they can see to bounce off the different chemicals and pigments throughout the ages. Um, they bounce back at different wavelengths and all that kind of fun sciencey stuff. But they can see the changes the artists have made before they did the final painting, or they painted completely on top of the entire thing, which I think is kind of cool to see the history of what artists chose to leave behind and what they choose to paint over, and the choices they made that they didn't keep, and some of the absolutely hilarious first starts that they painted on top of. With acrylic paint, it's pretty darn easy to paint on top of any mistake, any used canvas that's acrylic. You could re -gesso it if you wanted to, or just paint on top of what you have with something opaque, probably to start with. And it helps me reuse my canvases. That would also be another good challenge sometime, is to use one of my old canvases that I didn't have a good start with. I kind of stalled, and I didn't continue with it for a multitude of reasons but finishing up old ones or just fixing my old stuff would be a wonderful challenge and lord knows i have plenty of those hanging around because i don't like to waste canvases 
unless I've put way too much texture on it that the texture will not match something I want to do with a future painting and it's just going to detract from it. In that case it's a loss. You're better off just trashing the thing than holding on to it honestly because you've only got so much time and space in your life. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. But, and I'm talking thick texture. I love to do texture with gesso, with tissue paper and building up to a sculptural effect. And especially that's the point where you can't, I don't like reusing, uh, reusing the canvases at that point as well because I have something else in mind. Other people might. Good for you. I'd love to see that. If you've got something that you highly, highly textured and you planned out the composition and where it all went, didn't like it, and then used it for something else. How did you compensate for laying down such a strong path for a different painting? That would also be a cool challenge. Oh yeah, now I'm brightening it up again. I let that sky dry so this white on top will show up a little bit better and not blend into the background. That was also what I was having trouble with with getting it to brighten up is that light going into that darker background was just blending way into that blue. And I'm loving how I'm seeing this thing just dab on top. I'm using almost entirely bristle brushes for this whole painting. They are magic when it comes to hair and grass. If you've always used a Taclon brush, um, a very smooth brush with, with very smooth bristles, it's plastic. It should look like plastic. It might look like brown hairs that are very smooth. If you've always used one of those brush, switch to bristle brushes. I'm serious. There's a magic to them, a different kind of... Um, someone mentioned a softer, softer thing, brush stroke. Okay, I'm done with this little guy. Here is the final image of this little painting. This little guy has gone off to his home in the Chicago suburb, so it is gone, but there'll be prints available of this little thing. Done for one of my 30 day challenges, which I'll get back to one of these years. Thank you so much for watching and leave a comment with how you like to do with textures and working with the compliments and things like that with acrylic paint. Thank you guys.